And what's going on here today? Today you are at our second annual Green Market Festival where we're celebrating Rhode Island's green traditions and plant-based industries. And it's been a really wonderful day. We, um, it's hosted by the Farmer's Daughter and Landscape Creations of Rhode Island here in South Kingston. Uh, they represent two of our members, the Farmer Garden Center base as well as the landscape industry from design to masonry uh, and uh, nursery, uh, nurseries as well. So we have a good representation. A good representation of our membership. And what today. are you co chairing or? Actually, Catherine is the um, Rhode Island Nursery and Landscape Association Vice President, and she actually designed the layout of the festival today. Oh. So this. We couldn't have done this without her. Is so. the spiral your idea? Um, no, actually the spiral was the idea of um, a board member on the Rinley Board, the Rhode Island Nursery and Landscape Institute, which is our educational nonprofit arm. Uh, she's a new board member, um, a lovely young woman, and she she's also, actually the farmer's daughter. She also works here, um, <laughs> and she is a farmer's daughter yeah. as well. Uh -huh. She organized all the children's activities, and the spiral was her creation, and I am attempting to record it for eternity in a time lapse. Um, a time lapse film that will be available on the Rinla website. Yeah. So, what's the, what's the principle of the spiral? Well, the spiral is a um, it's a community art project, and everyone gets a two by two square as their um, canvas, and they get a bucket, and they can collect natural materials that people have generously donated, and they can feel free to create to their heart's desire. Um, and the idea is that there'll be enough people to complete the whole spiral and it, it creates a meditative walking garden. So uh, are they actually planting things there? No, they're, they're just laying them on the surface. Um, oh, nice. So it, it, it's sort of a painting with materials. Natural materials. With natural materials. So it'll look like a, it'll look like a painted, can, painted canvas with a spiral with all kinds of interesting colors and textures. So, so how we, many people attended this event last year? Last year we had 1,500. For our first year event, we had 1,500 people attend, which was pretty good when, since we didn't really do much in the way of advertising. So we were really proud of um, the turnout. Have you got a, prelim a preliminary figure for today yet? Um, I would say we probably did that that amount, if not more. Um, it feels It feels like we did we did very well, and I I, I, I want to say that tallied yet, yet. <laughs> yeah, but I, I want to say that what the whole purpose of this event is really just to get um, the broader community to understand the value of what we do and why we're why and how we contribute to um, Rhode Island's quality of life, but we also contribute to the economy as well, and so and then I think it's also another opportunity to bring. The, the agricultural and plant-based industries together because we're so interconnected and so it's getting us to talk to one another as well. So so it's really bringing our whole community together to celebrate something that Rhode Island should be proud of, I think. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. What kind of seeds are these? Carex 
Florida salis edge, and they grow in a wetland habitat. They're really beautiful. Um, once you see the seed pods, they're like really spiky and elongated, and this is what the seed will look like after we clean it. And so then we would stratify it and then grow the seed. One species, Carex crinata. This is a, it's called fringe sedge. And we do the same thing, so we rub the seed to get that seed coat off. And it, if you can see in here the little seeds that are coming out. Can you see that? Just the little seeds in there. Mm -hmm. And this yep. is what the seed looks like on that species. And that's cherry. And so the berries we clean a little differently. We like to use water to rinse the fruit out. So, so we take the berries and we put them in these greens. And we just kind of crush the berries and rub until we expose the seed, and these are the seed right here. If I can grab it. So it starts from a berry, goes to the seed, and then same idea, we put it through a stratification process, and then we can plant. And once I would rub all of this off, I would get the seed and then just rinse it with water. we're left with these really nice seeds. We let them dry out for 48 hours um, once they're all cleaned. And that's basically the process for a berry. These ones are easier because they have this big seed. But if you... You can do this any time of the year. You'll see it starting to get green. Always cut on an angle. Try so that the water, not into the tree, but away from the tree. Just to <laughs> show the importance of planting or putting things in your yard uh, to diversify, to attract not only honeybees, but, but more importantly around here, native pollinators. And I'm basing that on a study that was recently done in California and also in Germany. And what they found was they, they were actually interested in the, the uh, behavior of, of the honeybee. So out in California, what kind of an interesting study, they found through three years, recent three years, uh, as, as recent as 2012, they found that um, the European honeybee is more effective, it does better in the presence of a variety of native pollinators. And I never knew this until, until recently. So the problem with um, native pollinators today and honeybees is habitat destruction. Uh, people ask me, what's wrong with the bees? Why are, are they starving to death? Or, or what's going on? And the answer is, is uh, um, when you look at, you go to people's uh, yards and they have these nice pristine lawns sometime, and there's a place for that, but there's no habitat, there's no food for the native pollinators, and there's no food for the, uh, for the honeybees either. So we're encouraging people up in Massachusetts, for example, uh, near the Corbin area and in Amherst, uh, near, near UMass and South Deerfield, they're encouraging homeowners, because they own most of the property, to reserve 10% of their property to native plants. <laughs> Just let it go wild. Now, how that's working out, I you know, it will take some time. But the study has found out that um, in in the almond orchards, they plant uh, uh, different uh, varieties of almonds on in long rows. And what they found out was, in the in the presence of native pollinators, that. Um, they, the habitat, uh, or rather the uh, habits of the honeybee changes dramatically. Honeybees can tend to be a little bit lazy. Uh, they will only pollinate straight up and down in a row, and that particular... Uh, what brings you here today? Well, I'm here at the Green Market Festival. This is their second year, and uh, the Division of Agriculture has a good thing, but I'm here just to be supportive. This is a 
becoming an important part of the agricultural uh, green economy uh, scene in Rhode Island. Were you here last year? I was here last year, and uh, we were involved in helping it get off the ground initially. We were involved in, in helping to plan for the event, and we're, we're as supportive as we can be of it. Oh, thanks for being here. Thanks. Tell me about rain gardens. What exactly is a rain garden? Rain garden is a way to capture uh, runoff that would normally pick up pollutants from driveways, um, excess fertilizer, nitrogen. Um, captures it, puts it in the ground, as opposed to allowing it to run over the ground and into streams, lakes, rivers, etc. So Shannon was a pipe coming from the downspout. It isn't actually connected, but it comes from the downspout. And uh, it enters the higher part of the garden. We have stones here to prevent erosion so that the water infiltrates slowly. It doesn't wash the mulch away. On the other end, the lower end of the garden, it's a couple of inches lower, we have the outflow, if you will. We have that much rain, we're all in trouble, but this is where the water will flow out onto the lawn if it isn't infiltrated into the ground first. So environmentally friendly, uh, the pollutants that are absorbed by rain garden plants and percolated into the ground um, are numerous. Um, the microbial life in the soil cleans that water, returns it clean to the water table. Um, so it's a great thing uh, that anyone is doing. Anybody that puts a rain garden is doing a great thing. Great, thank you. Thank you. As well as repellents, um, ways to manage them by installing plants that uh, are native and not native, but they still don't get as much damage that occurs to them. Um, sprays that you can use, and many things in that realm. Do those sprays really work? They do, depending on the way you put them together. Species that are in the same genus or in the same group of poisonous plants. When I say poisonous, dermal toxicity. So poisonous to our skin causes rashes. We have poison ivy. We have a lot of poison ivy. Where's your costume? Uh, I, I, I lost my claws. <laughs>